Lynn Hiles Ministries presents That You Might Have Life. He said he didn't send his son to the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might have life. So Jesus came that we might have life. The Bible said in him was life, and the life was the light of men. The more light you have, the more life you're going to have. So you can have peace. Was on me. That's why it's called the gospel of peace. He took your punishment so you could get his peace. He took what you had coming so you could get what he has coming. All around the country and around the world, people just like you are awakening to the good news of Jesus Christ. What God wanted to do was release the kingdom of God in your life until the joy and the peace and the righteousness of the Holy Ghost would so fill your life. I don't want to just make heaven my home. I want to make my home like heaven. And now, here's your host, Dr. Lynn Hiles. Praise the Lord. I am excited again today to have with me a very special guest that uh, you have seen before with me. Uh, Danny Ray Phillips is with me from Lake City, Tennessee again, and uh, he was with me uh, another segment, and uh, wow, we just had an awesome, awesome time in the Lord. Uh, this young man is a tremendous preacher. You're really not getting to see his preaching gift, but I promise you this young guy can preach. He's a preaching machine, and he'll bless you. You better get you a cup of coffee in the Bible and sit back down with us because we're going to have a great time in the Word of God again today. He goes to, he hails from Lake City, Tennessee, where he is a part of uh, Pastor Justin Phillips Church there at Lake City Christian Center, Lake City, Tennessee. And uh, he is a mobile ministry. He travels in ministry all the time, just like I do. And he would be a great blessing to you, uh, probably, to have him in your church. There will be some information on the screen where you could contact uh, Brother Danny uh, Phillips. I, I call him an evangelist simply because people People understand that that means mo mobile ministry, but he's really more than an evangelist. He's really got a, a real prophetic gift in him and just gets a real revelation from God. But in the last segment, we were talking about, uh, you know, one of the things that's been on his heart is really something that's been dear to my heart as well, is that the Scripture tells us uh, that you are a chosen generation. You're a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Uh, to show forth the praises of Him who has called us out of darkness into His marvelous light. And one of the things that we discussed on the last uh, program when Danny was with me is the tragedy that we've, we've done by, I think, so many times making people believe the only way they can serve God is in a pulpit or uh, in a preaching ministry. Yes, and there's sir. more, much more to ministry than simply standing in a pulpit. I and certainly thank the Lord if you're called to that. That's wonderful. But I believe there are people that are in our congregations and in our families that have been called to business. There are people who've been called to the entertainment industry. There are people who are called to, uh, uh, you know, sports. I, I believe God can use those things. You know, one of the great things that Martin Luther did during the time of Reformation was he began to redefine what you could do to glorify God. And many times people thought the only way in that hour they could glorify God is if they were perhaps a priest or a monk or a nun in a monastery somewhere and would give themselves constantly to uh, the travail of prayer or whatever piety they might think was being required of God. But Luther began to declare uh, things like you could glorify God you know, just by simply being a good husband or a good wife, by serving your family, serving your children. And yes, it gave sir. life meaning in the context of faith because they begin to realize that it's not always the grand and glorious or the fame that God is interested in. He's interested in equipping people uh, everywhere that can touch people's lives with the bread and wine uh, you know, one of the things we discussed in the last segment was that the word consecration, when we consecrate somebody, means to fill the hands. And really the job of valid fivefold ministry in this hour, of apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And let me say they still do exist. Yes, People sir. say, well, they went out with the early church. No, the Scripture tells us in Ephesians 4, they would be with us until. Yep. That's a time word, until we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect or mature or complete man. But he tells us that the job of that ministry is to equip saints to do the work of ministry. And what we equip them with, Brother Danny, is we equip them with the bread and wine yes, sir. that we put in their hands that they can serve to the people on every day in the context of everyday life. And just take that and share some things with us about that. 
You know, Brother Lynn, we uh, we talked about the Melchizedek priesthood, you know, him showing up in Genesis chapter number 14, the first mention of a priest in the Old Testament, and what he had in his hand was bread and wine. Mm -hmm. We discussed the fact that 1 Peter 2, 5 and 9, uh, also Revelation 1, 5 and 6, Revelation 5, 9 and 10, every single one of those scriptures from a New Testament standpoint teaches us that we are priests and the Most High God. Mm -hmm. Now, let me say, in light of looking at the Old Testament priesthood, what their job was to do. In the Old Testament, when a priest would function in his part or his role, what he would do, first of all, depending upon what era of time you lived in, if you lived during the days of the wilderness wandering, uh, wanderings, you would go into the tabernacle of Moses, to where if it was during the days of King David, it was the tabernacle of David. If it was during the days of King Solomon, it was the temple of Solomon. But the primary function of a priest, first of all, was to go into the temple or into the tabernacle and minister to God. Mm -hmm. Their ministry to God would be, you know, making sure there was fresh bread on the table of showbread or maybe uh, trimming the wicks of the candlestick or making sure that in the morning and the evening there was fresh incense burning at the altar of incense. All of this was a type of worship. All of this was their ministry to God. Once they did that inside the temple or the tabernacle, they came back out to minister to the people. Mm -hmm. And so what we have is the whole study in the New Testament in picture form is what happens going into the local church to minister to God. We're empowered as we minister and worship God and empowered and equipped by the fivefold ministry. And then we come back out to minister to the people. That's it. It's not just me that does that from behind the pulpit, but it's the heart of God for all of His people to do that. We establish the fact that in Exodus 19, verse 6, that God desired for His people corporately to be a royal priesthood, a nation of priests. That dream in the Old Testament became a reality in the New Testament because of our identity in Christ. And what we have to give people out there that is struggling or whatever it may be is the finished work of Jesus Christ, who He is and what He's done. But you know, not only that, what empowers us to do that is the Spirit of God living on the inside of us. You know, the Lord said something real powerful to me back a couple months ago, and it's one of those things you kind of already knew, but the way God said it, it became fresh and it became new to me. And the Lord said to me something on these terms. He said, Son, by my Spirit living on the inside of you, you have what's called in Galatians 5, the fruits of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. But not only that, you have what's called in 1 Corinthians chapter number 12, the gifts of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. They belong, that, that's why they're the gifts of the Spirit, the fruits of, they belong to the Spirit. Right. And so by the Spirit living on the inside of us, we have all of the gifts and we have all of the fruits. Absolutely. Now this is what the Lord said to me that was powerful. He said, the fruits of the Spirit that's who I am. Yeah. Love, joy, peace, goodness, gentleness, all those that are there, there's nine of them. But he said, the gifts of the Spirit, that's what I can do. And by the Spirit of God being in every single believer, we have everything God is, says, and does. We have who He is. But not only that, locked up on the inside of us, we have what He can do. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we do have something to offer to humanity. As we go forth with bread and wine in our hand, the Spirit of a living God living on the inside mm -hmm. of us, we are equipped to give every single person that is hurting out there what they have need of to come to a place of peace, come to a place of stability. Whatever they need in their life, we're equipped by the Christ that's on the inside of us. Mm -hmm. And you know, you know, to me, one of the things that we can see even with the functioning of the gifts of the Spirit is that even in the context of being in uh, places like you know a beauty salon or 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 someone's living room or uh, in, in, in the business place or in a lunchroom somewhere, I, I I've just recently in the last several months begin to just you know when I see a need and feel a prompting of the spirit of the Lord you know not embarrass that person, but maybe say I, I really feel like uh, you know uh, God wants to heal your body, and just take them aside right there and and pray and minister to them and man we've seen the Lord heal people of cancer in the last couple of months we've seen them heal them of different things and, yes, and I'm, not, I'm talking about not even people that might necessarily be believers because that's what, how Jesus did it. I mean I certainly believe we ought to do it in the house of God but and that's not just me as a preacher I just challenge yep. saints 
that we are, like you said, that we're equipping to do this work of service, to let those gifts of the Spirit flow. You don't have to say yea and thouest and thee and, you know, use the yeah. old King James language, but you could speak into someone's life. You could get a word of wisdom about business. You can get a, you know, uh, you can get a, 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 a you know, a, a, a Spirit of God on you to work miracles you know, that can just uh, flow in any given setting. And, and so many times, see, we didn't think somebody could get healed unless the preacher could, you know, lay hands on us. Right. But one of the things you, you started to say in one of the other segments that I thought was powerful, and I preached it years ago too, is under the old covenant, uh, you know, there's a, there's a passage, I believe it is in Leviticus, that talked about all the things that disqualified uh, priests. Yes, sir. And, you know, I remember teaching years ago on that, and I had a series, and, you know, it pre really preached good. But, it, you know, because it said, you know, if, you, if a priest have a flat nose, he's disqualified. And, I, yeah. and I'd preach, well, your nose is your smeller, you know, you smell. That's your discernment. So if your discernment's no good, you're disqualified. And then if you had a, you know, a club foot or crippled foot, you were disqualified. And I'd preach, man, that's, if you can't walk in this thing, then you're disqualified. And, you know, it, 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 it had, it, if you had a running sore, you, you were disqualified. And that meant, you know, if you still had some anger, some hurt, and a wound, you were wounded, you were just disqualified. If you had a hump back, you were disqualified. And, man, the more I'd preach that and preach it hard. I'd, I realized, man, I ain't just disqualifying these people. I'm disqualifying yes, myself. Sir. And I'm standing there in the pulpit pointing, you know, you're disqualified for this and disqualified for that. And man, one night the Holy Spirit said to me, stop disqualifying my people. Yes. He said, I want you to stop disqualifying them and tell them that I took their flat nose. I bore it on the tree. I took their wound. I took their sore. I took their sin. I took their club foot. I took everything that could disqualify them from ministry, and I bore it myself so that it's not about disqualifying people now. It's about qualifying them. And I believe that's really where we're at in the message we're declaring is we're trying to show people you've been accepted in the Beloved. And you know, one of the things, even right below that in that Ephesians 4 passage that the Lord spoke to me a number of years ago, He said to me in Ephesians, it's in Ephesians 4, the last part of it. He said, let no corrupt communication go out of your mouth, but only that which is to the use of edification. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you've been sealed to the day of redemption. And I thought when the Lord said that to me, let no corrupt communication go out of your mouth, I thought He was talking to me about well, maybe I'm saying some words that he considers to be cussing, and I'm just not aware of it. Lord, just, you know, reveal to me which one of these words not to use. And the Lord said to me, I'm not talking about what you call cussing. Yeah. He said, because there's a whole lot more cussing goes on pul in pulpits than you know. And I said, what do you mean, Lord? He said, every time they get up and preach the law and put you back under a curse, they're cursing. Yes, sir. They're cursing God's yep. people. And every time you minister something to people that's not under the use of edification, in other words, it doesn't build them up. The word edify means to build up. If it's right. not to the purpose of building up the believer, then it is corrupt communication, and it is grieving the Holy Spirit of God. But when we begin to qualify God's people, and we begin to tell them, oh, yeah, you're good enough. I mean, you know what? It's not about being holier than the next guy or being super spiritual for God to use you. God can use you. God yes, can use you if you're a housewife. God yes, can sir. use you if you're a mechanic. God, he, he can use you if you've got weakness in your life. I mean, I'm not saying it's all right, some of the things that people have in their lives, but I'm going to tell you what, I've seen God use people completely when they were in a backslidden stage. Yes, know? sir. But what we need to do is let people know that they are qualified and that they can flow in ministry on all yeah. kinds of levels. You know, the interesting thing is when you talk about the Scripture at the end of Ephesians 4 when it says, let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth, mm -hmm. It goes on down and it talks about grieving the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And you know, I'm convinced of this. If there is anything that grieves the heart of God is that when we tell His people that there's something other than what He's told them. Yeah. In other words, when we use things from the pulpit and certain scriptures and things like that to beat God's people down yeah. instead of edifying, encouraging them and lifting them up. And the sad fact is it seems like over the years in the church that we've somewhat been guilty telling folk more so what's wrong with them rather than what Jesus made right, on, right about them at the cross. Mm -hmm. You know, when you look at Revelation chapter number 21, uh, the book of Revelation, the Revelation, not Revelations, the Revelation, it's full of highly symbolic language. Absolutely. But when you look at Revelation chapter 21 around verse 9, uh, the Bible says, John said, one of the seven angels which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues said, come hither, John, I will show you the bride the Lamb's wife. Mm -hmm. Now the Bible will interpret the Bible. Next verse says, He carried me away in the Spirit 
Everything John is getting ready to see is from the viewpoint of the Spirit. Right. Therefore, it's going to be symbolic. He carried me away in the Spirit to a great and high mountain. And this is what he said. He showed me that great city coming down out of heaven, the new Jerusalem. He just told John, come here, I'll show you the bride, the Lamb's That's wife. It. And then he just showed him that new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven. That new Jerusalem is not just some eternal rest home in the sky. It's a picture of his church. Now the interesting thing is, is that for the next several verses, what he's going to do is begin to describe the bride, the Lamb's mm -hmm. wife. And the first thing that he says about her is that she has the glory of God. Mm -hmm. And her light is like a stone most precious. And this is interesting. He said, even as a jasper stone clears crystal. Mm -hmm. I began to meditate upon that. And I went back to Revelation chapter uh, number four, and I believe it's in verse three or number eight. And what I found out was, is that the one that was sitting on the throne, which John seen, also looked like a jasper yeah, stone. Yeah, yeah. In other words, what the angel showed him was a picture of a woman that looked just like the one that was sitting on the you throne. You make me want to preach. And then you get on down and she has all of these precious stones in her and there's gates of pearl and streets of gold. That's not fancy stuff that's going to be on some other planet somewhere. That is God describing the beauty of His bride. Yeah. And for us as ministers to stand behind a pulpit or anywhere else we may go to say anything degrading to a member that is of the household of faith, we are actually doing an injustice to what Jesus died to provide and we're grieving, by the, we're grieving the Holy Spirit by allowing corrupt communication come out of our mouth. God says His bride is good looking. She's got the glory. God ain't going to marry no ugly woman. Yeah. He married a good looking woman. That's the way He's describing her and that's how we must describe the church also. And I think one of the things you know that I've always heard people quote is, and it's misquoted most of the time, they'll say, uh, you know, they'll say things like, He's coming back for a church not having spot, wrinkle, blemish, or any such thing. And man, that preaches good. You know, he's yeah. coming back and we got to get this old hag called the church cleaned up. Uh, and we got to, you know, we got to get her straightened out. Washed. <laughs> but you know, the scripture they quote is misquoted. They're misquoting it. It does yes, not sir. say. The scripture does not say Jesus is coming back for a church not having spot, wrinkle, blemish, or any such thing. It says in Ephesians, I believe it is the fifth chapter, it says that, uh, it said, uh, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church, and gave himself for it, that he might wash her by the washing of the water, by the word, that he might present her to himself, not having spot, wrinkle, blemish, or any such thing. I submit to people that that's not something he's going to do. That's something he's already done. Yes, he's sir. already washed me with his blood. See, I've always looked back and said, you know what? The, somebody said to me, well, you know, I, I have a series that I title, uh, and, and perhaps we'll offer it, I don't know, on this, this program, but I have a series I, I have titled The Lamb's Wife. And what I show in that series, uh, Brother Danny, is you're not going to get married to him. You're already married to him. Yes, sir. And if you're not married to him, number one, it's illegal to use his name. Mm -hmm. Number two, it's, it's illegal to be intimate with him. Yep. But the new covenant is your covenant relationship. It is your marriage certificate. He got married to us 2,000 years ago when on Calvary's cross, he looks down from the cross, he sees his mother weeping. If there's anything that would make you ever want to come down off the cross, and get down off of there, it would not necessarily be all the mockery of the people, but your mother weeping. If there's anything that made me want to get down off the cross, it'd be my mama down there yep. crying and saying, I thought you were the one. But Jesus rears back, and he doesn't use a term of endearment to address her. He uses a prophetic term. He yes. says, woman. And what he's trying to do is give his mama some comfort in the middle of his passion, because he's saying to her, he's trying to get her to remember a prophetic scripture, that the seed of a woman... Yep. I feel like preaching. Come on. The seed of a woman is going to bruise the head of the serpent. What he's trying to say is, Mama, you're the woman. Yep. I'm the seed. And, and, and I need you to just stay with me long enough to see that, that, that uh, this is bigger than what's happening here. And then he turns around and says to John, Son, behold your mother. Woman, behold your son. In other words, he puts his, his mother into the care of John. And then a few minutes later, he'll rear back and say, Elo, Elo, Sabachthani, which is to say, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What's occurring there? Brother Danny, is that he is forsaking his father and his mother, and he is cleaving to his bride. Yes, sir. In other words, there's a marriage taking place there. And when the blood and water flows from the side 
of the second Adam, when the spear of a Roman soldier will bust the hide and send you and blood and water will come out, that blood and water was what cleansed us and purged us. And that's where a marriage ceremony took place long like it was long ago in a misty garden when God opened the side of the first Adam, pulled a rib out and brought to him a woman on Calvary's cross. He opened the side of the second Adam and brought to him a bride and he presented her to himself, not having spot, wrinkle, blemish or any such thing. He don't care what somebody think, else think about her. He presented her to himself. Yes. Yes, sir. You know, that's what we need to see is when God views me as his bride. Hallelujah. You know, yes, he sir. sees me as being purged and cleansed because he's the one, he knows how I got clean. He knows how I got purged so that I am in fact married to him just like you said, Revelation 21. Of course, uh, what is it? I believe the third, fourth chapter. I think it's the third chapter of Revelation says to him that overcomes, I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God which is New Jerusalem. Yeah. So, and, 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 and uh, I believe it is uh, the Apostle Paul wrote it and said, we are built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being made, the, you know, the, was the chief cornerstone. So, this whole building of God in Revelation 21 is not just a place, but it is a people. It is the bride, yes, the land. It's the community of faith. And I love how, you know, King James says, you know, it says, uh, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. But the Message Bible uh, says it like this, look, look, God has moved into the neighborhood. Yes, sir. And you know, uh, I, I, I always tell people when I preach that God has moved into the neighborhood, I tell them, slap your neighbor and tell them property values just went up. Hallelujah. Yep. And the reason property values went up is because when God moves into the neighborhood, He begins a major renovation program. And He says, behold, I make all things new. Hallelujah. And you know, yes, Gerald sir. and Kathy in your church, Gerald and Kathy Hovader wrote a song and uh, you could probably contact the same place you contact Danny to get this song, but they wrote a song called God Has Moved Into the Neighborhood, and yes, it's a sir. powerful song. But God has moved into the neighborhood. Property values went up because when He moves in, He says, Behold, I make all things new. God starts a major renovation program. Yes, sir. And as God begins to, you know, do a major renovation program in our life, he works from the inside out. Mm -hmm. He don't begin to clean our flesh up. He begins to do a work in our spirit. And once we begin to really realize what's true of us in our spirit, our flesh and our way of thinking can't help but to be affected by what's already true of us. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm convinced as able ministers of the New Covenant, we need to convince people of who they are in Christ. Mm -hmm. We need to convince them of their true identity. You know, the scripture says uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter number 3, around verse 18, I believe it is, that we all with open face, uh, King James says an open face, the literal translation of that is an unveiled face, mm -hmm. behold as in a glass the glory of the Lord mm -hmm. and are changed into the same image. Mm -hmm. And you know, uh, that glass, according to the book of James, is the Word of God. Yeah. The mirror, literally it means a mirror is the Word of God. And with an unveiled face, when we look into the mirror of God's Word, we're not to see a dirt bag. We're not to see a sinner. We're not to see somebody with all these faults and failures in their life. What we are to see is the glory of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Because that's what the New Testament says is true about us. Revelation 21 verse 11, when this bride is des described, the Scripture said that she had the glory of God. Now, in light of that, talking about the priesthood of the Old Covenant, there was this thing, the second piece of furniture that you would come to in the tabernacle of Moses, the labor, um, which was called the labor. When they went past the brazen altar, the priests would come to this labor, and the Bible said this labor was made of brass, and the bottom of it, what they had, was from the looking glass of the women that stood outside of the outer court. Mm -hmm. And so this priest could look down into this labor mm -hmm. through the water and look in this mirror, and in the Old Covenant, what they see was dirt on them. Mm -hmm. And they had to clean that dirt off them before they could go in. But here's the powerful thing. When you look into the Scriptures, not that you just see what's wrong in your life, mm -hmm. but where you look in there and that you may see that you have certain issues, there is also something in there to clean you up. That's it. And here's what got me. Where the water come from is where all the water came from. They drank, and for every other logistical need they have, it came from the smitten yes, rock. Yes, it did. And so the same thing that sustained them and gave them life was the exact same thing that cleaned them up. And Brother Lynn, I'm convinced of this, that what will clean God's people up from filthy things that they feel like 
is in their flesh. Come on, preacher. It is based upon the cross of Calvary where the rock was smitten. 1 Corinthians chapter number 10, we all did follow that rock, or we followed that same spiritual rock, which was Christ, which was smitten. There was a river that flowed from His side that gave us life. But not only that, it's there to sanctify us, to make us holy, to make us clean. There is nothing else that will sanctify and clean you up but the blood of Jesus. And that's why we must be determined to preach nothing else except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And you know, the powerful thing of it is that blood cleansed us, it continues to cleanse us, yes, sir. and it will finish what it started. The same way with the Word. It's a done deal. It's accomplished. But you know one of the other interesting things, is, uh, you were talking about the labor that was made from the looking glasses of the women. They would also take the sacrifices and go in there and wash the sacrifices and the blood from their hands. Yep. So that when you would look through that water, you'd have to look through the blood. Yes, you know, that's sir. a powerful way to see people. Yep. Is when you look through the blood, you cannot see yourself as being disqualified. You cannot see yourself as being the dirt bag. You cannot see yourself as being not good enough because what that does is it qualifies you and makes you accepted in the beloved. One of the things that the Apostle Paul said was to Philemon, he said that the communication of your faith is by the acknowledging of every good thing that is in them. And when you start to preach and tell people who they are, they will begin to respond and they will begin to become what I call believers because we are then declaring a message that produces faith in them and they're starting to believe who they truly are yes, so that they are not disqualified from coming forth with bread and wine to give to others. They're not disqualified from giving the miraculous. If we could just release the saints, I believe there's people out there right now, you're full of miracles. You have no idea how yes, powerful sir. you are. You have no idea the gifts of God that are in you and God wants to release them. And, uh, you know, we're just about out of time, but I want to just, I just want to tell you, I want to encourage you that you, you, you have been qualified uh, by the blood of Jesus. And there is bread and wine in your hands, what he did and who he is that you can share with people. Because it's not about us. See, if you're preaching you, you're preaching the wrong person. Yep. When you're preaching him, I believe the apostle Paul would say, I profess to know nothing among you but Christ and him crucified. I want to thank you for tuning in. We're going to have uh, Brother Danny Phillips back again. This young man's going to bless you. He's an incredible preacher. You need to get him to come. He'll bless you. But I just want to say to you, please share with your friends about what you're hearing. If you're enjoying this and you're enjoying the message you hear, Tell your friends about it because we want to, we just really want to get the message out. And if you've been blessed by it and you want to partner with us, there's going to be a number on the screen. You can go to our website and, and donate. You can uh, help us by getting products uh, and uh, that we offer on the program. But we do need your help and we do appreciate you sowing into the ministry because it helps us to preach the gospel of grace all around the world. So take a moment right now and call that number on the screen or write to us. The, the address is there or go on the website. There's several ways to do it. And please just go ahead and do that. And we just thank you for joining us. God bless you. And I'm going to tell you, you are somebody in the kingdom of God. Amen. Thanks for taking the time to join our broadcast today. This program has been made possible through the generous donations of our partners around the world. If you'd like to partner with us, please send your tax-deductible gift to Lynn Hiles Ministries, P.O. Box 127, Great Cacapon, West Virginia, 25422. Or call us at 1-304-579-5336. Also, you can visit us online at www.lenhiles.com to view the large selection of books, CDs, and DVDs we have available. And until next time, remember in Christ, all of God's promises are yes and amen.